Okay, guys, I'm on. Okay, we're on. I told you I'd be back. The reason why I decided to do another one, because tomorrow is Thanksgiving, Lord Jesus willing. It's Thanksgiving tomorrow, and so we won't be able to do a live stream. So I'm going to cancel the weekly Bible class that I go to. I don't teach there, but I'm canceling, so I can do another session with you guys, and that will be your Thanksgiving. Can you guys hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Okay, so yeah, okay, because I don't know why I said no sound. So this will be your Thanksgiving treat, your Thanksgiving dessert. I'm doing another one because tomorrow there won't be no live stream because tomorrow is Thanksgiving. So Lord Jesus willing, we're going to enjoy Thanksgiving. So today is your Thanksgiving dessert, right? So just wait for the few people coming. Sorry, guys, uh, if I get frustrated... I get angry and I can't tolerate people, just pray, God, purify me by the blood of Jesus and fill me with the Spirit and just destroy my flesh, crucify my flesh, to be just quick to block people and not to be a stumbling block because not everyone's going to agree with my approach of being harsh. And I want to be more gracious and loving and more Christ-like. But it's not true that there is no time or place in which you can be harsh with people and treat them like fools and idiots for trying to pervert Scripture and blaspheme our Lord. Right, but do pray for me because I want to be more filled with the love and the joy and the peace and the patience of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I just don't want to be an unnecessary stumbling block, Serene. Not everyone's used to this kind of approach. Not everyone is. Because we've, we've been taught a version of Christianity that's not necessarily biblical, where you always have to be nice and lovey-dovey. You know, where men are basically effeminate. So if you're bold and loud and in your face, I don't see Jesus in you, brother. And there are times in which I do sin in my anger. May God save me from that and have mercy on me and protect me from error and wash us in the blood of Jesus and fill us with the Holy Spirit to be in love with Jesus. But I do pray, Jesus, for all of you who can put up with my imperfections because you're not here for me. You're here trusting the Spirit to use me to preach truth. And you'll tolerate me for the sake of Jesus. And one thing I do appreciate, and I want to say this again, I want to say this. I don't want people to be blind puppets, and you're not. You guys are <clears throat> soldiers of Christ, men and women of the Lord, that you're going to go back and study the verses I give you and trust the Spirit to guide you to show you where I'm wrong and where I'm right, because I don't want to produce puppets of myself. I don't want, God forbid, in Jesus' name, I pray this never happens, cult followers and you're not that. I don't want to, to have many Sam Shamoons. I don't want that. I want all of us to be like Jesus, soldiers of the Holy Spirit. So I don't want you to just accept what I say, but don't challenge me. Here, don't challenge me until you hear my case and then take the arguments and go study them and come to your own conclusion. Obviously, if I thought something was wrong, I wouldn't teach it. If I'm teaching it, it means I'm convinced it's right, right? Right? It would only be stupid and foolish of me to teach something that I knew was wrong. If I, if I know it's wrong, I'm not going to teach it. If, if I'm teaching something, I'm convinced it's right. If you think I'm wrong, ask the Spirit to show me. Keep it to yourself because I don't want you to just accept everything I say, and I'm not going to accept everything you say. Let's accept everything that comes from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is pleased to use imperfect human vessels to preach His perfect word. That's the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. And you know why? Let me repeat. Some of the reasons why the Holy Spirit does that. So I want to just teach as we wait for the rest of the people to show up. The reason why the Holy Spirit uses imperfect vessels is so that no one human being becomes the focus of attention, the center of attention, so that all eyes will be fixed on Jesus because he is the God-man. He is perfect. He is holy and worthy of all worship, love, praise, glory, and honor. So the Holy Spirit will use misfits like me, like David Wood, so that people won't make us more than we are and see us for what we are, spiritually sick sinners who need the great physician to heal us and love us and comfort us and perfect us and seal us and be patient with us, Lord Jesus. Please, we need you. We love you. We're in love with you, Lord. Please help us, Lord Jesus. I pray the Lord doesn't give me what I deserve, but gives me his grace in Jesus' name, right? So put up with me 
hear what I got to say. Don't challenge me. Go like once. All right, you don't want to debate. The reason why I'm debating is because you're challenging me. Don't challenge me here. You want to set up debate? We'll debate. Set it up. Here, ask me a question sincere. Let me answer. Take what I have to say. You reject it? Fine. Reject it. Reject it. Right? Do you get my point? And you guys know I don't shy away from a debate, right? You know that. I'm not trying to be proud or arrogant. May God crucify my flesh. And we trust Holy Spirit to fill this session like he did previous session to glorify Jesus. In Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, we love you. Flood us with your presence. Flood my daughters with your presence, Holy Spirit. Okay. Abdul Hu Akbar. I would more than happy to debate you and bury your prophet deeper in hell. So are you ready? We can do it right now. Abdul, Abdul Hu Akbar. You ready? Abdul Hu Akbar. I want to use a presage to show that your prophet is the son of Satan. You ready for that? Make my day. We're waiting for a few more faces to show up. Come on, guys. We're 150. What happened to all of you? You left? You disappeared? Yeah. The demons come out when you mention Zechariah because that's their tarot. Notice Zechariah and then more Muslims showed up because Zechariah is their idol. That's the one they worship. You're a liar then because Abdul Hu Akbar is a Muslim name. So you're ashamed of being a follower of Muhammad and I'm ashamed for you. I'm ashamed of Muhammad too. So you tell me what your religion is or I'm going to bounce you to Mecca. What's your religion? See, these are these are the cowards that won't say they're Muslims because they don't want to defend their prophet because they know they can't defend their prophet. It's impossible to defend this agent of Satan. Come on quickly, Abdul Hu Akbar. Yeah. Hey, well, we're going to send them to Mecca. Don't worry, Lee. Send him back to Ashra. All right. He's not going to, he's wasting our time. All right. Uh, send him on his merry way. No, you're not a Christian. You're a liar. Say, okay, I want you to type because I want to mention your name. I want to send people to your, oh, I wish you didn't block him. Can he still hear me? Okay, he's gone. He's bounced. All right, forget about it. Pizza, I'm bound. Don't ever insult pizza. Okay. We're going to unpack John 17, but let me say, a few more things. Can well, Is he listening, though? A few more things about icons. Let me again repeat. I'm not saying you should have icons or statues. I'm trying to respond to the question biblically. Okay, You understand the difference between me telling you go get an icon and me answering the question whether icons are damned in Scripture? You understand the difference? You understand the difference, right? Between me saying every one of you should have an icon or a statue, and with the question, does the Bible condemn icons and statues? What was my answer in the previous session? Because I want to finish the point. Yes and no. The Bible condemns statues, <clears throat> icons of gods and goddesses that are wrongly worshipped in the place of the true God. But the Bible does not condemn icons, images, statues in general. Because God himself fashioned images, statues. Provided those images and statues were not taken as gods and goddesses and worshipped as such, right? Was that point clear? Just let's review. I hope Nada's here and Orthodox is here. I don't know. Ili put two. I don't get it. Ili, if you're coming in the midst, go listen to that because I don't know what two means. You don't get it? Because I won't spend about 40 minutes on that point because I don't know what yeah two meant. If you mean two, no, I don't get it. Yes, I get it. All right. I hope uh, Orthodox is here as well. All right. Now. Okay, so I also demonstrated that bowing down to someone is not necessarily an act of worship given to God. And I showed First Chronicles 29, 20, right? Remember that? Where they bowed down to Jehovah and David the king. Now, someone brought up the case of John bowing down to the angel. Why was that wrong? Because the context tells us why. It suggests that John was showing excessive reverence to the point of deifying the angel. You with me there? Showing excessive reverence to the point of deifying the angel. Because the angel's response indicates such. Because in Revelation 22, verses 8 to 9, the angel says to him, I'm a fellow slave like you and your brothers, the prophets, worship God. That indicates to me that John, John, 
<clears throat> in his excitement, in his ecstatic frenzy, in his prophetic frenzy from seeing the glorious figure and the revelations by the Holy Spirit, he forgot himself for a moment, got caught up in the frenzy, and ended up showing excessive reverence to a being that he should not have shown such reverence to and needed to rebuke, correct it, and needed to repent. You with me there? Because I'm going to make a point out of John. I want to make a point out of John the Apostle. Are you ready for me to show you the, learn, the lesson to learn from John the Apostle? Okay. Did you know John made that mistake twice, not once? John made that mistake twice, not once. Now, we got most of the people here, and those who come in later will catch it by going back and listening to the live stream. Revelation 19.10, and then Revelation 22, verses 8 to 9, back to back. Revelation 19, verse 10, and then Revelation 22, verses 8 to 9, back to back. Because I want to make a point here. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou, do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's the first time. You think he got it the first time. Now notice the second time, folks. As the Holy Spirit anoints the voice of the sound of my voice to be pleasing to your ears and fills me with health to glorify Jesus and the power of his might in Jesus' name. Okay, notice this. You think he would get it the first time, right? But then he does it a second time. Revelation 22, verses 8 to 9. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou, do it not, for I am thy fellow servant of thy brethren, <clears throat> the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Notice not once, but twice, John committed the mistake of idolizing this angel. So why did the angel forbid John? Because the context suggests that John was showing excessive reverence, bordering on worship worshiping God. So he's showing a reverence to this angel that bordered on idolatry because such reverence was on the level of worshiping someone as a God, right? Because of the angel's response, worship God. In other words, don't give me that kind of worship because you're not simply honoring me. You're not simply respecting me. You're going above and beyond such honor and giving me a devotion that belongs only to God, and in that sense, it's wrong, it's idolatry. You with me there? You understand the point that I'm trying to make? But notice John did it twice. You'd think he'd get it the first time, but he did it a second time. He didn't learn the first time. This tells you, again, that we are creatures of repetition. Sometimes we have to learn something over and over again until it becomes second nature, right? Even in the case of John. He didn't get it the first time. He did it a second time. He almost slipped into idolatry a second time, and the angel had to correct him, rebuke him for it a second time, right? Are you getting that point? Are you getting that point? Before I move on. You know what you're supposed to see from this example? Why would the Holy Spirit record these two instances in which John momentarily lapsed, momentarily lapsed into idolatry and had to be corrected immediately, rebuked immediately for that idolatry? Because the Holy Spirit is showing you, see, even the best of saints and even those closest to Jesus are still prone to commit the worst of sins. That's why your hope cannot be in any man, no matter how exalted. If John, who's an apostle of Jesus, an eyewitness of Jesus, who would rest his head in the bosom of Jesus, who's filled with the Holy Spirit, who did miracles and wrote scripture by revelation of the Holy Spirit, if this man can lapse into idolatry, not once but twice, and immediately to be rebuked, to be protected from that heinous sin, then that's a sign to every one of us we cannot put our hope in any man on this side of eternity because even the best, best of saints on this side of eternity are capable of the worst sins. So your hope has to be in God and God alone. 
Do you see what you're supposed to learn from that example? Even an apostle like John, as great as he was, filled with the Spirit, saw the earthly Jesus, God in the flesh, used to put his head in his bosom, an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus, an eyewitness to Jesus' physical ascension, flooded in the presence of the Spirit, did miracles by the power of the Spirit, spoke words from the Spirit, wrote scripture by the Spirit. Even he was prone to commit idolatry not once but twice and needed to be immediately corrected to be prevented from committing such a heinous sin. If even someone like that is prone to committing such a wicked sin, then Jesus is telling you, don't put your trust and hope in any man, no matter how exalted, on this side of eternity. Because everyone on this side of eternity, everyone living in this fallen world with this fallen sinful body is capable of committing the worst of sins and disappointing and breaking your heart. So don't cling and cleave to any imperfect vessel, even if he or she is an apostle or prophet. Give your undivided trust and allegiance and love to the triune God, to the God-man and him alone. You with me there? You understand the point? Your hope is to trust in Jesus. That's the point, Ron. That's what I'm trying to drive home. You need to cleave to Jesus, cling to Jesus, be in love with Jesus, and never let him go. Because he is your life. He can never fail you nor disappoint you. That's why I keep telling you, do not blindly follow me. I'm not saying you are, but I have to be honest. Do not blindly fo follow any human teacher. Do not make any of us more than we are. Don't make David Wood more than he is. Don't make James White more than he is. It's too late, man. I started second session, 6 o'clock. Go for it. I love you, brother. Praise the Lord. Gorgeous. gorgeous. Sorry. Thank you, thank you. See, because of you guys, I canceled the class with my brother here because you said tomorrow's Thanksgiving, so I decided to stick around for you guys. See? That's good. Now well, you well, send well, me your you. send me gift cards, credit cards, and blank checks to show your appreciation. Love you, bro. Okay. Okay, you with me there? Do not make anyone on this side of eternity fallen human vessels, no matter how much you love them, more than they are. I promise you will disappoint you. We will disappoint you. That's a promise. So why would the Holy Spirit record, not once but twice, John's momentary lapse into idolatry as a lesson for all of us? Even someone like the Apostle John, even someone like the Apostle John, a man who saw Jesus, walked with Jesus, was filled with the Spirit, was an eyewitness to the resurrected Jesus, an eyewitness to Jesus' physical ascension into heaven, who received dreams and visions in the spirit, did miracles in the in the spirit, wrote revelation in the spirit. If he's capable of such sins, how much more someone like me, someone like James White, someone like David Wood? You with me there? You understand what you're supposed to learn? So why was the angel rebuking John? Because it shows that that act of worship wasn't simply honor and reverence. John had gone above and beyond simply showing reverence, and that act bordered on worship, worship given to a deity. And that's why the angel rebukes him. How do I know? Because the angel says, worship God. The very fact that the angel has to say that, that I'm just a fellow slave like you, and your brothers, the prophets, and those who hold to the words of this book, worship God, tells me in that rebuke that John was now going above and beyond what was acceptable behavior. That act bordered the, the worship given to a deity. And the angel is not a divine being, but a creature, a spirit creature, a servant of God. And that's why he tells him, don't do it. You see? But when the Israelites bow down to Jehovah and David the king, when the Israelites bow down to Jehovah and David the king in 1 Chronicles 29, 20, neither David nor Jehovah rebuked them because there that act was appropriate because they were not worshiping David as God alongside of Jehovah. They were worshiping Jehovah as God and honoring David as his human representative on earth. First Chronicles 29 verse 20. And that's why it was accepted.
Thomas Hugh, bowing to the Kaaba is idolatry because the Kaaba is a house of worship of gods and goddesses, a fact even admitted in the Hadith literature because that was a pagan shrine housing <clears throat> idols of gods and goddesses. That is idolatry. That's number one. Number two, no Muslim says that God is present in some special way in the Kaaba for them to bow towards the Kaaba. So why are they bowing to it? When the Jews would face the temple in Jerusalem, Thomas Yo, they would do it because God said, I will put my presence here in a special, <clears throat> unique manner. My presence will be localized in a special way so that I am truly present in this temple in some sense. We don't know how exactly he was present, but he was present there in some unique, special way. So when they're bowing to the temple, they're bowing to the God who now had lived in the temple. But why are the Muslims bowing to the Kaaba? No Muslim thinks that Allah's presence is in it, number one. And the Kaaba originally house was a shrine of 360 idols. Blatant idolatry. Damnable by the true God of the Bible. You see, Thomas Yo, The difference here? You with me there? Everyone with me or am I boring you guys? Are you bored with this or are you still trucking with me? I don't know what happened to Riaz. He disappeared, huh? Okay. Okay, so now another example that is often quoted to show that bowing down to someone is completely rejected in Scripture, specifically the New Testament. Acts 10, 25 to 26. Acts 10, 25 to 26. Oh, Riaz is here? I didn't see him. Okay, good. Glad he's here. Pray the Spirit will fill me for the glory of Jesus to interpret scriptures as accurately as possible. This is another one that's quoted. Acts 20, 25, 26. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. <clears throat> okay, I'm sorry. Stand up, I myself also am a man. Now here they say, you see? Any type of reverence is forbidden, not just worship given to a deity. Is that the case? Is that what we find here? Peter's refusal, <clears throat> refusing Cornelius to bow down in quote-unquote worship and saying, stand up, I'm just a man like you. Does that mean any type of reverence whatsoever is inappropriate in light of the New Testament? Is that what we derive from this passage? Well, Jesus is God in the flesh. Is that what we derive from this passage? Is that what we are to get from this passage? That see any type of reverence, not just worship given to deity, where you bow down to something or someone as if he or she is a god or goddess. Is that No, what you're seeing here is an indication of Peter's humility and humbleness. It's not so much that such an act is inappropriate as it is Peter feeling unworthy of such an act of reverence. You see the difference? You understand the difference here, right? Are you following me? Are you listening? I want to make sure you're listening. If I'm boring you, let me know, because I don't want to bore you, I want to bless you. Okay. It's not so much that such an act of reverence is idolatry. You with me here? Idolatry. It's more that more so that Peter deems himself unworthy of even that type of reverence. No, it's not excessive reverence, Thomas Hill, because the context shows. Cornelius had abandoned the worship of gods and goddesses and started worshiping the true God of Israel. So he knew about the danger of idolatry. He knew about <clears throat> the reticence, the condemnation of worshiping other beings as gods and goddesses. That's clear from the context. So you would really be stretching things quite a bit and arguing that Cornelius was bowing down to Peter in worship, in the sense that Cornelius was acknowledging Peter as a divine being, a God-man of sorts, because Cornelius had already converted 
to the true faith at that time, which would have been the faith of the Jews and was worshiping the God of Israel and had abandoned the worship of gods and goddesses and idolatry. So this would have been simply Cornelius's way of showing respect and honor to Peter because of Peter's position in the sight of God. You want me there? So it's not that such reverence is inappropriate as it is an indication of Peter's <clears throat> unwillingness to even accept that type of honor, though it isn't idolatry still, he doesn't feel himself worthy enough to accept even that kind of honor and reverence. You with me there? I'm trying to be as clear as possible as the Holy Spirit guides my mouth and protects me from error. You get what, what I'm saying here? In Acts 10, 25 to 26, it's more of Peter not feeling worthy of receiving such honor in contrast to that act of reverence being inappropriate, even though it wasn't idolatry. In other words, Cornelius wasn't thinking, oh, Peter's a divine being and I'm going to worship him as such because Cornelius had already converted to the true faith, which at that time was the religion of the Jews. And an angel had come to him and told them, now to complete your journey, to complete your faith, you need to accept Jesus, who's the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Hebrew scriptures and the very God of Israel becoming flesh. So send Peter to now complete your understanding, to complete your faith and complete your journey, your path to salvation. So he knew that Peter was just a man appointed by the true God to bring to him the message of salvation. That he knew because the angel had told him, if you read the context of Acts 10. So then why did Peter not accept it? Not because such act of reverence is inappropriate, because it's idolatry. No, that's not the reason. It's because Peter deems himself unworthy of even that kind of honor. You with me there? That's what you're supposed to take away from Acts 10. He didn't feel himself even worthy of that type of honor, even though he's an inspired emissary of Jesus Christ, whom Christ has honored and exalted to be one of the foundation stones of heavenly Jerusalem. Did you know that? That heavenly Jerusalem, the temple that comes down from heaven, has 12 foundations. And those 12 foundations have the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb, meaning that heavenly Jerusalem is built on the foundation of the apostles, one of whom is Peter himself. And yet this man thinks, I am still not worthy of that respect that you're showing me. Because all I am is a man. Clear? Or am I confusing you guys? But if bowing down before a Christian is idolatry, folks, you have problems. Do you know why? Because of Revelation 3, verse 9. Revelation 3, verse 9. If bowing down altogether is idolatry and forbidden, then you have a problem, Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. Because Jesus says, And behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, right? But are not. Waiting for the second book. And are not. But do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. I'm going to make them bow before your feet in worshiping me. So they'll bow before your feet in their worship of me as an act signifying that they too realize I love you, the church. Do you catch it or no? So if bowing down before a believer is altogether wrong and prohibited, even if your intention is not to worship that believer as a God, then what do you do with Revelation 39 where Jesus says, I will make the unbelieving Jews bow down to your feet in worship of me in acknowledgement that I love you, the church. Before I move on, man, if you're not tired, I'm getting tired for you.
Bedros, didn't I block you under two other Knicks? But you're back. Man, you are persistent. You with me there? I want you to understand what I'm getting at. You are getting tired, Susan? Sorry, sister. I can close the shop now. You love me, so you attack me and accuse me of violating 1 Corinthians 13. I love that, man. I wonder what you do if you hate me. Where is the love? Let it sink in before I move to the next point. Are you seeing that none of the examples cited are clear-cut proof that you cannot show reverence, veneration to a holy servant of God, a human vessel of God <clears throat> whatsoever, that you can't show any reverence of any kind to human beings used of God mightily through whom God glorified himself. Yes, you cannot bow down to someone in an act of worship <clears throat> in acknowledging that that thing or person is a god or goddess. That's what God condemns. Worshipping someone or something as a god or goddess. But to say that you can't bow down and revere someone altogether, no matter what your intention and purpose is, that's not biblical. That is not a biblical teaching. That's not a biblical teaching. Yep, hit that like button, man. You with me there? Am I clear thus far? That's not a biblical teaching. So does the Bible condemn images altogether? No, it doesn't. God himself co commanded, fashion, or had people fashion images. Is the Bible against Believers showing reverence and honor to other men and women of God, used mightily by God, exalted by God, through whom God has been glorified. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. You with me there? I'm just sticking with the Bible. I'm just sticking with the Bible. You with me there? No, it doesn't. Exactly, Bond. As Bond said, idolatry can take various forms and shapes. Anything that you live for, anything that is the focus of your life, anything that consumes you, that is an idol and it's your God. Did you know that? So thank you, Bond, for bringing it up. Here, let me show you. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Am I boring you guys with the details? Are you learning how to interpret the Bible much more correctly? Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. If I'm boring, you put it too. I promise I'll stop because I don't want to torture you. But if you're learning, I'll keep going. Colossians 3, verse 5. Here, idolatry takes various forms and shapes. Watch here. Colossians 3, verse 5. Read with me. Colossians 3, verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication. Kill fornication in you. Uncleanness. Kill it. Inordinate affection. Unnatural affection. Having unnatural affection... For the wrong things and wrong persons, like homosexuality, evil, evil con concubescence, covetousness, which is idolatry. Did you catch it? Colossians 3, verse 5. To covet something is to commit idolatry, folks. Did you see it? Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, when you covet something, lust for something, that is an idol. Post it one more time so you can see it. Colossians 3, verse 5. Read the last four, part. Covetousness, lusting after something, coveting something is idolatry. Why? Because the thing you covet consumes you. You become enslaved to it. It becomes the focus of your life. It draws all your attention to that thing, and so it becomes your God, and that's idolatry. So covetousness is a form of idolatry. So if you're consumed with your job, that's an idol. If you're consumed with making money, that's your idol. If you're consumed with your looks, trying to look better, that's an idol. If you're consumed with sex, that's an idol. Anything that you covet and desire more than anything else and you live for and becomes the focus of your life, that's an idol. That's your God. You're worshiping it. That's Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Philippians chapter 3, verses 16 to 19. Philippians chapter 3, verses 16 to 19. Philippians chapter 3, verses 16 to 19. 
Another form of idolatry. Notice what Paul says again. Philippians 3, 16 to 19. Guys, read this. Nevertheless, where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. We have not attained our goal yet, so let's walk by the same rule of faith. Let's have the same mind. Let us mind the same thing. Let us have the same purpose and goal in life, like-minded as Christians. Notice 17. Brethren, be followers together of me. Follow my example. Follow me. Follow this path I'm on. And mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Whoever walks like us, uh, like, like us, mark them. Imitate them. Honor them. Mark them. Right? Those who walk like us. Notice 18 and 19. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now watch here. Watch here. Verse 19. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. And whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. What does it mean their belly is their God? Whose God is their belly. What does it mean their belly? Meaning they live for their desires. Belly here is metaphorical, not just gluttony. No, typically bear. No, 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 not just food. Belly here means your cravings, your desires. It's a metaphor for your cravings, your desires. Whatever you crave, whatever you desire, not just food, whether it's sex, sexual gratification, whatever you crave and desire, that becomes your God. Belly here being a metaphor for your cravings, your desires that are contrary to the spirit and the will of God. Okay. Okay. Therefore, before I move on, and this is only relates to those who listen to the first session because it's the second part of that session. Is it clear from what I've shown you from the scriptures? Images in and themselves are not idolatrous. God himself had people fashion images and use the image of a bronze serpent for people to look to to heal them. Was that clear? Did I make that case clear? Having images... Having an image is not idolatry. What is idolatry? Having an image, a statue, an icon of a god or goddess that you worship in place of God. That's number one. Then I also establish that bowing down to someone in reverence is not necessarily idolatrous. It's not idolatry because there are plenty of examples in the Old Testament. And I gave you an example, Revelation 3 verse 9, where men and women exalted by God, honored by God, Receive such veneration without this being idolatry. Was that clear? Because I want to sum up this point. Was that clear? Was that clear? Yep. Okay. Now, the greatest proof that God isn't against Idols or images, Colossians 1.15, let's repeat that again. Colossians 1.15, here's the link to the Greek. Here's the link to the Greek. It says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Click on that link. You see the word for image? It's icon. That's the Greek word from which we get icon. It's icon. That's the word icon, meaning Jesus is the greatest physical statue, image, icon of God. Jesus himself is a living icon, a living image, a living statue of God. That's the Greek word. It's right there. Click on it here. In fact, are you aware all human beings are statues of God, living statues? living images, living portraits of God, because the Bible says man is the icon of God. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 7. You don't believe me? 1 Corinthians 11, verse 7. 1 Corinthians 11, post it, and I'll get you the Greek. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 7. Here you go. Let me get you the Greek. So you don't, believe, so you don't take my word for it. Okay. It says, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much he is the image and glory of God. Folks, click there. Click there. 
Don't take my word for it, cloudy Kaaba toilet. Be biblical. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in all truth and save you and I from error and sin and to love Jesus and to know his word. Click there and see it says man is icon, k doxa, right? Doxa is the Greek word for uh, glory, theou. Icon, k doxa, theou, hu perchon, hu perchon, being the icon and glory, the image, the statue of God. So human beings are the living statues, images, icons of God. How then can God be against icons? How then can God be against images? Petros, you know you got to leave, right, brother? You got to get out of here? Why are you here? Can you block this guy? I don't know why this guy keeps coming back. Petros, don't come back to my channel, man. I don't know why. I, I, do I have to put a restraining order on you? Okay, so folks, let's sum up this point. It's like a stalker, man. I'm, I'm feeling like I'm being stalked on social media. Okay, let's... Sum up the point so we can go to John 17 and finish it. Okay. Have I shown you ample biblical proof, ample biblical proof that God does not condemn images in general altogether? I'm trying to be as biblical as possible. I'm not Roman Catholic. I'm not Orthodox. I still subscribe to Protestant evangelicalism because I believe in sola scriptura or sola fide until I'm convinced otherwise. Okay, I'm trying to be biblical. So if I sound Catholic or Orthodox, it's because those aspects of Catholic Orthodox teaching happen to be correct because they're anchored in the Bible. Not everything Catholics and Orthodox believe are wrong. Not everything they believe is right. Same with Protestantism. I'm trying and I'm going to fail until the Lord takes me home to be as biblical as possible. So I'm going to take things that may go against Protestantism but agree with Catholics and Orthodox. So what? I want to be committed to the Bible. I want to be committed to the Bible, right? And beyond that, beyond that, was I able to make a case from the scriptures that bowing down in of itself is not idolatry, it's not worship. And those cases in which Peter or John, or where Peter refused the worship of Cornelius or the angel re refused the worship of John, the context tell us why. Not because such reverence, if it's not intended as an act of worship to a god or goddess, is wrong. But there was a reason why those specific acts were rejected. Clear? Was I? And I need you to go back, listen to the first part, because I spent over 40 minutes unpacking this. So I'm wrapping up in the second part. Now, if you still disagree with me, uh, let me repeat again. Even if you think I'm wrong, that's okay. Even if you think I'm wrong, that's okay. I don't want you to believe what I believe. I want both of us to believe what the Holy Spirit wants us to believe, provided we've understood the scriptures that the Spirit has produced and live it out by His power for the glory of Jesus. Honestly, I pray the Holy Spirit will give us that grace. Right? But we can agree to disagree and not condemn each other. We can agree to disagree and not condemn each other. Please. And then, let me repeat what I said in the previous session. If you are against images altogether, you, if you're here saying, I'm against images altogether, okay, then please be consistent before the Lord. No more Jesus films. No more Jesus cartoons. No more books or Bibles with cartoon images of any biblical figures because those also are images. So if someone tells me, well, we don't know what Mary looks like. Really? Then why did you see the passion of Christ? Why do you have a children's Bible with the drawing of Mary when you don't know what she looks like? You with me there? If that's your argument, you don't know what she looks like, why then do you have children Bibles with drawings of Mary when you have no clue what she looks like? Drawings of Jesus. Or, so be consistent. Reject all depictions altogether. No more you know, Bible cartoons, 
Bible films. Don't go watch Samson. Don't go. Nothing. Nothing. Nada. Zip. Be consistent. And if you're consistent and do that, I'll respect you. But if you're going to watch a Jesus film or have a children's Bible with images, but then condemn someone for having an image as a reminder of that figure who's now glorif glorified in heaven, then you're inconsistent. You are inconsistent. You see my point? You get my point? Let me repeat that last point as we go in John 17. If you have no problem watching depictions of Jesus in cartoons or films or any biblical character or comic books depicting biblical figures or children, children books depicting biblical figures, but then have a problem with people that have images that remind them of saints or, or angels or even Jesus in heaven, which they then show respect to, then you're inconsistent. But if you reject all of that across the board, then you're in then you are truly consistent and I have more respect for you. Thank you Susan Baker. Right? Does not can you do me a favor? Can you go and listen to my series on communion of saints and to show you that you may have a problem that's fine, that's your conviction? But don't impose that problem on others because I, too, used to have a problem. But then, biblically, I no longer have a problem. You obviously didn't hear my multi-part series on communion of the saints, right? You haven't heard that? And I don't want to keep repeating the same arguments. Okay. Tizda, if you go on my channel, I have, I think, five-part series on communion of saints. Five parts. I address all these points and why biblically I no longer view the intercession of saints in heaven as something contrary to scripture or idolatrous. And I came to that conclusion because of the Bible, not because of any tradition. Okay. And if you still reject the evidence I give, that's fine. That's okay. But when you say of a problem first, Watch the five-part series. I believe it's five parts, Tizda. I believe it's five parts. You'll see it. I put in the title, Communion of the Saints. After you hear my comprehensive case from Scripture, and you're still not convinced, that's okay. We can agree to disagree. But please don't condemn me for believing contrary. Okay, six parts. Thank you, first and last. It's six parts. I didn't know. Please listen to them slowly. Open up your Bible. Read the passages. And then say, Sam, I'm not convinced. That's okay. Don't attack me. Don't condemn me. Don't fight with, with me if you're still not convinced. I'm convinced, and I'm not convinced because of tradition. I used to argue against communion of saints, intercession of saints, until I sat down and went through the biblical passages and the objections to the use of these passages by Catholics and Orthodox from the Protestant side and found the Protestant objections wanting, meaning lacking, were not strong. You with me there? Did I finish this point? Did, did we get this issue out of the way, this question? Orthodox asked me, and I think Orthodox disappeared. Okay, okay good. Let's finish John 17. Uh, I'll put, you know, you, you'll, be, you'll help me to be patient, brother, if you leave my channel, not come back. Can you leave, brother? I don't want you here. That will help me to be patient, because when I have... Uh, stumbling blocks like you, then I can't be patient. Can you leave, brother? Don't come back, please. Please? Do I have to beg you or I have to bounce you? Exactly, Andrew Martin. Can you leave? I just want to see if he's going to leave on his own on his own volition or I have to send him on his merry way. Hold on, let me just see. Do you agree not to come back? Say yes so I don't block you, brother. You're wasting my time now. No, 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 you don't need to learn. You need to leave, brother. Sorry. Okay. Can we send Abdu somewhere else? Because he needs someone that can be patient with him. He said he wants to learn, but he's complaining about my patience. So bye-bye, brother. Thank you. All right. Everyone clear? In time, by the grace of the chime God, we're going to weed out the wheat from the chaff, and we're only going to have serious people who want to hear the arguments for themselves and study them. 
No more nuisances, no more know-it-alls, no more, none of that. We're, this channel is going to be completely sanctified. Amen? Hopefully, by the grace of God's spirit. <laughs> okay, let's come back to John 17. This is Zechariah's, one of Zechariah's favorite verses. Let's finish it. I began explaining how to address John 17 in the previous session, but let's finish it now. I saw the Bible in a way that you would bounce me if I post it right now. You shaped away. What do you mean? Well, you mean in the past, right, Pedro? You mean in the past? You would have seen the Bible in a way that you would have challenged me and I would have bounced you, but not now, you mean, right, Pedro? That's what you mean. You mean before, not now. It's okay, Tizda. God bless you. Just watch my series, Tizda. Yeah, that's okay. Let's I say, Pedro, you can disagree with me. Just don't condemn me, fight me, debate me. Sam, I disagree with you. That's fine. And move on. That's it. I'm going to repeat this like a broken record. Please. Please. I don't want you to believe everything I tell you. If you're still convinced I'm wrong, after studying the arguments in depth prayerfully, fine. So I don't know how much more sincere I can be in telling you. Fine. Beautiful. Let's respect each other. Don't condemn me. Don't try to prove me wrong. Don't try to debate me. It's of no use because if I thought I was wrong, I wouldn't share this perspective. Right? Right? So if you think I'm wrong, I may be wrong, but I'm not at the point to see I'm wrong. Pray for me. If you're wrong, may the Spirit show you. But arguing with me is not going to make me see it. Believe me, it's not going to make me see it. Challenging me is not going to make me see it. It's not. It's just going to cause chaos and confusion and division and anger and sin. Okay. Now, let's finish John 17, 3. Let's finish it. John 17, 3. Thomas, you, you don't want to do it a second time, do you? Well, it'll be your first time on YouTube. Second time with me, I think. Okay, John 17, 3. Let's finish this, brother, brethren. I'm tired. I really am tired because don't forget, this week is going to be a hard week for me. Many of you are going to be enjoying Thanksgiving because you're with your families. Although I have a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ and family members, the two most important family members on earth, my two angels, my nine-year-old, seven-year-old, and I won't be with them. So I'm going to have to struggle with that pain of not being with them. And I'm not trying to get into a pity party and make you feel sorry, but it's the truth. You guys will be celebrating Thanksgiving with your loved ones. Hopefully. No one's in my situation. Though I have my oldest brother here and I have nieces and cousins and I have brothers and sisters in Christ, it's not the same. It's not the same. It's never the same because the dearest human lives to my heart on earth, on earth, my two angels, my nine-year-old, seven-year-old. And I know they're wondering where their Baba is. Yeah. Hey, Jesus knows how much I love and ache for them. You don't know how much I love and ache for them. I can't wait. I can't wait to hold them. I can't wait to kiss them. I can't wait to still love on them. You know, Pray for my miracle that God will set me free from this financial debt that's not mine. It's my ex-wife. May it fall on her and the Lord protect my children. Save me from this wicked judge, this daughter of Satan. Keep me planted here because I can't fight this battle, folks. I can't. When people are saying I'm tired, I am tired. I'm a tired Christian. I won't call myself a saint or a soldier, but I am tired. It's only the Holy Spirit sustaining me and preserving me for the glory of Christ because if the Holy Spirit lets me go, I'm gone. Anyway, John 17, verse 3. John 17, verse 3. Let's look at it. Thank you, guys. Thank you for praying and loving me. Let's read this. And this is life eternal. That they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Now, depending on which group, this was brought up by a Muslim. So depending on which group brings this passage up, you're going to have to finesse your response accordingly. Let me give you a principle to follow. Are you ready? A principle to follow. Write down, we're not going to read it, write down 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. Write that down. Paul says to the Jew, he became a Jew. To the one with the law, 
he acted as if he's under the law. To one without the law, he acted as if he had no law, though he did have the law of Christ that he was subject to. And he says, I became all things to all men that I may win some to Christ. Now, what Paul is not saying, Paul is not saying he was being deceitful, dishonest, deceptive, pretending to be something he's not. That's Muhammad and Muhammad's God. Muhammad and his God are deceivers and liars, not Paul. What he meant was this. Let me explain what he meant. He meant is that he, he presented the gospel in such a way that he didn't compromise on the truths of the gospel, but explained them in a manner that made sense to the people he was reaching. And he didn't put a burden on them because they weren't followers of Christ. In other words, if he went to gangbangers, he wouldn't tell them you better stop having sex before marriage because they don't care about the law of God. He first told them about the love of Jesus and turned to Jesus. And when they fell in love with Jesus, then he would say, now that you love Jesus, this is how you honor him, obey his commands. You understand his point? You understand what he's trying to say? You present the gospel in a way that makes sense to them and don't put any unnecessary obstacles and barriers until they fall over Jesus. So if I have a person who's shacking up with his girlfriend, the, the first thing I do is talk about Jesus and he needs to turn to Jesus, not Hey, man, you need to stop having sex before marriage. That's a sin. That's fornication. He's going to say to hell with you. I don't care. You get my point? Because when he gets convicted and falls in love with Jesus, then you can tell him, if you love Jesus, you want to honor him, right? Yes. Well, one of the ways you honor him is, honor him is no sex before marriage. Okay. You get the point? Now, how does it relate to apologetics, evangelism? I will communicate the truths of the gospel in a manner that makes sense to the people that I'm addressing. In other words, if I'm speaking to a Muslim, to speak of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, will miscommunicate because that sounds like three gods. So how can I present the same truth of the Trinity in a way they can't object, even though they may not accept? God, his eternal word that became flesh and his eternal spirit. No objection. You know why? Because in Islam, they believe Allah exists with his eternal word, which became a book, and the Ruh Allah proceeds from Allah. You see the point? You see the point? So if I'm talking to a Jehovah Witness, I'm going to respond differently in addressing John 17, 3, than I would with a Muslim. Since it's Zakarnaic, the way you turn this against the Muslim, the way you turn this against the Muslim is simple. I did it in the first session. Let me do it again in the second session. Hopefully, I'll be done with John 17. It won't come up again. Hopefully. Hopefully. But knowing us, we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature by the grace of God's Spirit. I do anticipate I'm going to have to address John 17, 3 again. Okay. Now, First of all, I tell the Muslim, according to Jesus in John 17, who's the only true God? They're going to have to say the Father. I go, but wait, 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 be more specific. The Father of who? John 17 verses 1 and 2 tells you the Father of Jesus Christ. Because he says, Father, glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. That's Jesus, right? So, since the only true God is the Father of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ being his Son, you just proved that I could never be a Muslim. Jesus wasn't a Muslim. And the God of Jesus is not the God of Muhammad. Why? Because Muhammad said, Allah is a father to no one. Jesus is not his son, right? The highest relationship you can have with Muhammad's God is a slave to master relationship. And the Lord willing, in the next session, God willing, as the Holy Spirit reminds me, I'm going to refute the weak, pathetic response to that. Muslims say, well, the reason why Muhammad did away with the title of father, because it miscommunicated, because of the misunderstanding that surrounded the term, which is why he did away with it. God willing, in the next session, I'm going to destroy, decimate that objection, showing how pathetic that objection is. But for now, for now, John 17, as it stands, proves that Muhammad is a false prophet, an antichrist. Because he said Jesus is not the Son of God and his God is not the Father. But Jesus says the only true God is his Father. So thank you for exposing Muhammad as an antichrist. Thank you for exposing Muhammad as an antichrist. Next, 
That means Islam is not even on the table. It's not an option anymore, according to John 17, 3. So we're done with Muhammad, right? Now let's go back to understand what Jesus meant and what Jesus did not mean. What did Jesus mean to say and what, in, what did Jesus not intend to say by saying the Father is only true God? Okay. In the context, I'm going to show you that Jesus did not mean to say the Father is the only true God to the exclusion of the Son and the Spirit. Jesus' statement is not intended to be directed to him and the Spirit, meaning in contrast to me and the Spirit, he's the only true God. That's not what Jesus was getting at. Jesus is affirming a fact. The Father is the only true God because what kind of God can the Father be if not the only true God? He's the only true God in contrast to the gods and goddesses of the pagans of the time, the gods and goddesses worshipped by the Romans and the Greeks and the others. Because don't forget, both the Romans and the Greeks worship Zeus as the God and the father of the gods. The Greeks called him Zeus. The Romans called him Jupiter. So what Jesus is saying is eternal life comes from knowing the father as the only true God, in contrast to the gods and goddesses wrongly worshipped by the Gentiles. You with me there? Do you know how I know that Jesus is making that statement? In contrast to the gods and goddesses worshipped by the Gentiles, not in contrast to him in the spirit. In other words, Jesus is not saying he's the only true God in contrast to me in the spirit because we're not the only true God. Because the same author, John, who wrote John, wrote 1 John 5, 20 to 21. 1 John 5, 20 to 21. Let's unpack this. I won't take too long. And then... Lord willing, next session, I'll go into that canard. Why Islam rejects the title Father. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us un an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in the Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. There you go. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. So he's the true God in contrast to the idols, the false gods of the nations. Not in contrast to Jesus or the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? Did you catch it? The same John who wrote Jesus' words in John 17 tells us, that the Father is the only true God in contrast to the idols of the nations. So Jesus' statement is true. The Father is the only true God. Because what kind of God can the Father be if not the only true God? In contrast to the gods and goddesses of the Gentiles. He's not excluding himself and the Spirit. He's affirming the deity of the Father in contrast to the gods and goddesses of the Gentiles. Clear before I move on, or am I confusing anyone? Someone's confused. Say, I'm confused. Explain a little deeper. Okay. Now, to hammer the point, to hammer the point that Jesus is not excluding himself, but that he believes that he is essentially one with the only true God, that Jesus is one with the only true God in essence and power and glory. Let's look at the first two verses again. John 17, verses 1 to 2. I don't even need Isaiah 43, verse 10. John 17, verses 1 to 2. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. I already unpacked this in the previous session. Let's repeat. Can a creature aud audaciously look to God and say, glorify me so that I may glorify you? Notice it's reciprocal and conditional. Reciprocal in that you glorify me, I glorify you. You glorify me in the way I glorify you, I glorify you in the way you glorify me. And conditional. Glorify me so that I may glorify you. Does that sound like a creature? If that's a creature, that's satanic. That's blasphemous. 
You get my point? It's reciprocal and conditional. Reciprocal in that glorify me in the way I glorify you. I'll glorify you the way you glorify me. Reciprocal and conditional. Glorify me so that I may glorify you. This would be utter blasphemy for a mere creature to say, which is why you'll never find any God-fearing creature saying these words. Right? Clear? Is that clear? Is it sinking in before I move to the next point? The second point, it says, as the son whom the father glorifies, he has authority over all flesh. Let me ask you a question. This is a question you ask Muslims. Is Muhammad flesh? Yes. Are you flesh? Yes. So according to Jesus, Jesus owns your Muhammad, owns you, owns all humanity because all flesh belongs to him. All flesh is subject to him, meaning even your Muhammad, whose flesh is subject to Jesus under the feet of Jesus. Are you okay with that? Muslim, are you okay with that? That all flesh, you, your mother, your wife, your children, your Muhammad, all of you being flesh, belong to Jesus, are subject to Jesus, and Muhammad, whose flesh is under the feet of Jesus. Do you Are you okay with that? Because you quoted it. You quote it to prove to me Jesus is a Muslim. Well, the Muslim Jesus says, Muhammad is flesh and flesh belongs to me. Muhammad belongs to me. He's under my feet. I own him. Right? You quoted 17.3. You're going to have to accept all of it unless you're going to tell me 17.3 you reject. Don't quote verse 3 and ignore the context which buries Muhammad and exposes a religion of that's a religion of Satan. I don't care what they say, Alpha and Omega. And if you're not listening, I'm going to block you, my brother, from a different mother. So they're telling me God gave Jesus authority over Muhammad. And how does that change the problem? So you're not listening. This is what's killing me about you. You're not listening. So God gave Jesus authority over Muhammad. And they're okay with that? Are you listening, Alpha and Omega, or are you pretending to listen? So this is what you kill me. Why don't you listen and understand instead of pretending to listen and think you have an objection? I wouldn't even use that, Riaz, because you have to develop that argument. So Alpha Omega, are you going to repent for asking questions that you think are relevant and are strong? Okay, did everyone else get it? Everyone got it? Besides Alpha and Omega, who pretends to get it? Even if you tell me the Father gave authority. So the Father gave Jesus authority over your Muhammad. So the Father wanted Jesus to share in his lordship over Muhammad. Because if Jesus has authority over all flesh, that means he owns all flesh, he owns your Muhammad, and the Father wants Jesus to own your Muhammad and own you, sharing in his lordship. So you're saying that your God committed shirk by elevating Jesus to share in his lordship over Muhammad and over you? Come on, Alpha and Omega, when are you going to think biblically and deeper instead of shallow? Why are you such a shallow thinker? Everyone got it now? You understand how Alpha Omega just embarrassed himself by pretending to be a Muslim? That argument backfired. So thank Alpha and Omega for pretending to be a Muslim because he just humiliated himself and Muhammad. So even if they tell me the father gave him authority, so you're saying, wait, the father whom you say is Allah gave Jesus authority to share in Allah's lordship, Rububiya, his sovereign lordship over all flesh, making Jesus his partner in his lordship, his sovereignty over all flesh. So Allah wants Jesus to be lord over your Muhammad. Okay. Okay. Did it sink in? That's okay, Alpha Omega. 
You answer like a Muslim. You got treated like a Muslim. You got pwned. Booyah. Sucker. So far, are you with me? Everyone with me so far? Before I move on to the next point. The second part of verse 2 is even more powerful. The second part of verse 2 is even more powerful. It says, let's look at it again. Let's look at it instead of me just repeating it. Verse 2, 17-2. As thou hast given him power, authority over all flesh, that he, the Son, should get eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. So Jesus says, I am the Son whom the Father has entrusted. The Father has trusted me to give everlasting life to all he brings to me. As in the previous session, I'll repeat the point. The kind of life that Jesus gives is not just never-ending life. It's moral, incorruptible physical indestructible life where he will give you physical bodies that cannot be destroyed that cannot die and change you in such a way that you'll never be able to sin ever again he's going to make you morally incorruptible physically indestructible and he does this for all those whom god brings to trust in jesus right let me repeat the question i asked in the previous session what kind of attributes must Jesus have to give a whole host of human beings moral incorruptibility where he changes them so that they'll never be able to sin again, making it impossible for them to sin, and giving them physical bodies that can never be destroyed? So he has to be all-powerful and omniscient, right? Why omniscient? Because he has to know who are the ones that the Father gives to him and how many they are and has to have the power to preserve them indestructible, incorruptible forever. And that's a power that only God possesses. Right? So now, Riaz and everyone else, you're telling me that in the very next verse, after what Jesus just said, he's going to go on in the next verse to deny that he's God? So you mean he just said all this in verses 1 and 2, only to then say in verse 3, oh, and by the way, I'm not the only true God. Only the Father is? Really? Is that what you want me to believe Jesus meant to do? After saying what he just said in verses 1 and 2, he then goes on in verse 3 to say, oh, and by the way, I'm not the only true God. Only the Father is. Really? Do you think that's what Jesus really had in mind? Honestly, when you read verses 1 and 2, are you going to come to the conclusion that in the next verse, he's now going to contradict all that he just said about himself in relationship to the Father, claims that no creature can make, but only someone who's God Almighty can make, only to then say, oh, and folks, the Father alone is the only true God, not me. It looks very stupid when they do that, right? When you then read the context, it shows how stupid their argument is, how dishonest, how deceitful, how wicked and satanic their argument is, right? When you examine it in that context, right? Right? But you know who's to blame? Can I tell you who's to blame? And it's not to put you down. I pray God will use me to lift you up. Chasing us when need to be chastened and then built up. You're to you're the ones to be blamed. You are to be blamed. You know why? Because you let them get away with murder by letting them start at three and then jumping to five and ignoring verses one to two. You are to blame. I don't expect Muslims to know my Bible or to handle it honestly because the Bible is our sword from the spirit to use to glorify Christ. You guys are to, be, to blame. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are one God. Yes, not the same person. You with me there? 
I blame Riaz. I blame Alpha and Omega. I blame first and last. I blame Billy. I blame the Christians. Because you let them start at verse 3. And then instead of going to verses 1 or 2, you jump to verse 5, giving a partial answer, and let them get away with murder. Right? But after tonight, those of you listening, I want to see after tonight if you're going to make that same mistake. I hope not, because that means I'm failing as a teacher. God forbid. I'll tell you in a minute, Cloudy. Okay, so those now let me now put the icing on the cake without even touching verse five. Do you remember verse two? Verse two, Jesus said that that he, the son, may give eternal life to all that you've given him, right? That's what Jesus said. He now Revelation 22, 13 this is so excited that he keeps going to chapter 9, verse 31 to show that there Allah and Jesus are said to be Lord which does nothing to address John 17, 3, because at most that means the Quran is contradicting John 17 because the Quran is saying Jesus is Lord, but John 17 is denying it. So my brother from a different mother is excited because he learned something new about John chapter 9, verse 31. Quran chapter 9, verse 31. Yay! Okay. What does chapter 9, verse 31 got to do with dealing with John 17? The most you proved is there's a contradiction between the Quran and the Bible. Because John 17 denied Jesus is God, but you're showing me that the Quran affirms he is. Come on, Revelation 22, 13. You know better than that. Right? Okay, are we back now to the point? John 17, 2? Because I'm almost done. John 17, 2. And by the way, he did in the previous session, too. He kept mentioning chapter 9, verse 31. Yes, I know. But it's not a trick. Cha 931, the continental text, just does identify Jesus as the Lord that Muslims are to look to along with Allah. But that's a different argument. We still need to deal with John 17 before we venture into the Quran because all this creates is a contradiction between the two books. But read John 17, verse 2. Okay? John 17, verse 2, one more time. Because I want to finish this with a bang. Come on. That he, the son, should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Now, pay attention to this because we're going to go to a parallel to this statement. I'm going to show you a parallel to this statement. Let's go to John 10, 27 to 28. John 10, 27 to 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Jesus speaking. He says, they're my sheep. They hear my voice. They know me, and they follow me. I know them, and they follow me. Now pay attention. And I, I, Jesus, give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Guys, pay attention. Jesus says, they're my sheep. They hear my voice. I give them eternal life. Again, he says that, like he did in John 17, too. No one can pluck them, deliver them out of my hand. If they're in my hand, they're the sheep in my hand. The sheep in my hand, guys, pay attention. The sheep in my hand. And if they're in my hand and they're my sheep, they can never perish because there's no power to pluck them out of my hand because I guarantee their eternal preservation, right? My sheep, my voice, my sheep in my hand. No one can take them out of my hand. I give them eternal life, right? That's what Jesus just said. My sheep, my voice. Sheep in my hand, I preserve them, I care for them. No one can deliver them out of my hand, I give them eternal life, correct? Okay, now let's see what Jesus just did. Psalm 95, 6 to 8. Psalm 95, 6 to 8. Pay attention, growing everyone else. My sheep, sheep in my hand, hear my voice. My sheep, sheep in my hand, hear my voice. Psalm 95, 6 to 8. Let's see if you catch it. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before Jehovah, our maker. For he is our God. We are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice. No, I don't think you caught it. We are the sheep of Jehovah's hands. We are to hear his voice. Jesus said, there are my sheep, the sheep in my hand. Do you hear my voice? 
Who caught it? Who caught it? Do me a favor now, Protestant believer. Post John 10, 27, 28, with Psalm 95, 6 to 7, back to back. No, not John, Riaz. Jesus applied the psalm to himself. It's Jesus speaking. Okay, let's read it one more time. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Sheep in my hand, my hand. Eternal life I give them. My sheep hear my voice. Now, Psalm 95. Oh, come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before Jehovah our maker. For he is our God, we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice. The psalmist says, you don't need to post verse 8, Protestant. I know you're excited. You posted 7 twice in a row. And then verse 8. The psalmist says, we are the sheep in Jehovah's hand, and we are here to hear Jehovah's voice. Jesus says, they're my sheep in my hand. They hear my voice. <whistles> Thank you, Protestant. Protestant loves us so much, he gives us bonus verses. <laughs> Did it sink in? Or no? <whistles> and then Jesus says, what? I give them eternal life, and no one can pluck them out of my hand, right? John 10, 28, one more time. John 10, 28, one more time. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now, compare what you just read with Deuteronomy 32, 39. I give them eternal life, no one can pluck them out of my hand. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Guys, pay attention. Pay attention. Jesus says, I give them eternal life. No one can pluck them out of my hand. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Pay attention. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill, I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there anyone that can deliver out of my hand. Whoa. I make alive. Jesus says, I give eternal life. No one can deliver out of my hand. Jesus says, no one can pluck them out of my hand. Whoa. Wow. Wow. Feeling. Whoa. Feeling. Oh, but now 29 and 30. John 10, 29 and 30. Watch here. John 10, 29 and 30. Now notice what he says. My father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. Wow. Notice. No one can pluck them out of my hand. No one can pluck them out of my father's hand. Why? Because we are one. But you know what's beautiful? Do you see that verb are? You Greek speakers can confirm. I and my father are one. Let me show you what the Greek is. Here you go. Thank the Lord for modern technology. <laughs> okay, here it is. Let me get you the link. Modern technology. <laughs> go there. Click on the link. It says... Ego ke ha pater hen esmen. You see that word esmen? It's plural. Plural. It's a plural verb, and it's literally, I and my father, we are one. Esmen is plural. It's we are. Showing that Jesus is not the father. The father is not the son. And he says, we are one. So you see the context, guys, pay attention. Jesus says, they're my sheep in my hand, the sheep of my hand. They hear my voice. I give them eternal life. No one can pluck them out of my hand. No one can pluck them out of my father's hand. You know why? Because the father and I, we are one. One in what sense? We're not one person. We're one 
in our ability and power to preserve all believers forever, guaranteeing they will never perish. Jesus saying that he's one with the Father in power, in divine power. Okay. Now let's see the response of the Jews. John 10, 31 to 33. We're almost done. Lord willing, in the next session, I'll address some objections. John 10, 31, 33. Yep, the trying God is amazing. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? Now notice what the Jews say in 33. Notice what they say in 33. The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. See, they understood the language of Jesus. They knew the Old Testament. You're a man, a flesh and blood Jew, a man, but you're speaking as if you're God because you just claim the things that the Old Testament ascribes to God. The Old Testament says God makes alive. No one can deliver out of his hand. You said you, said, you give eternal life. No one can pluck out of your hand. Old Testament says we are the sheep in Jehovah's hand. We are his sheep to hear his voice. You're saying that believers are your sheep in your hand. You preserve them. So you're not the father and you are a man and claim to be God. We know the father is God and we know a man can't be God. And you're not the father and you're a man and yet you claim to be God. You get it? Now, question, folks. Since the Father is the only true God, pay attention now, Riaz and everyone else. Since the Father is the only true God, and Jesus the Son says, I am one with the Father in his power and ability to preserve all believers incorruptible, to guarantee that no believer will ever perish and be destroyed, I'm one with him in that ability, in that power to guarantee the eternal preservation of all believers. Then Jesus just claimed to be one in essence with the only true God. Since the Father is the only true God and Jesus is one with the Father in essence, in his divine ability and power, that means Jesus is essentially one with the only true God. He's one in essence with the only true God because he's one in essence with the Father. And the Father is only true God. And since there can't be a second true God, that means in context, if Jesus is one with the Father in power, making him one with the Father in essence, then that means Jesus is one in essence with the only true God. And since there can't be a second true God, he too must be the only true God. Thank you, Alex. Do you see why the early church was forced to the doctrine of the Trinity? You got it now? You see why, Riaz, going to verse 5, you're not making the best case possible. You're actually allowing the Muslims to get away with murder, and you're not making the best case possible by just going to verse 5 and ignoring verses 1 and 2, and then showing the relationship of John 17, 17 verse 2 with John 10, 27 to 33. You see what I did? I took John 17, 2, where Jesus says, the son gives eternal life to all that the father gives him, and then took it back to John 10, 27 to 30. Ron M., what does Hebrews 1 got to do with John 17? The objection is from John 17. Make sure you answer the objection from the book that they're misquoting before you go to another book. You got it now? Everyone got it? Was it clear? Even a blind man can see that the Bible teaches that the one true God is triune, three eternal relationships, three distinct persons, eternally existing as one God, and that Jesus is God in the flesh, the God-man. Even a blind man can see that, right? So... Lord willing, in my next session, I'm going to answer the objection that Muslims raise on why Muhammad denied the title Father for Allah, 
further embarrassing Muhammad and his followers, and deal with John 10, 34 to 39, which is what they cite to deny that Jesus claimed to be God Almighty in John 10, different from the Father, yet one with him in power and essence and ability. But for all of you, did you see how irrefutable the immediate context of John 17, 3 and the overall context of the Gospel of John happens to be in affirming that the Father is the only true God in union with the Son, not excluding the Son. He is the only true God in union with the Son, as well as the Spirit, not to the exclusion of the Son and the Spirit. Clear? Did you guys get it? Everyone got it or people are confused? Someone confused, let me know. No, Rianz is a Christian. He's a brother in Christ. But he, he's using select arguments because you guys have been influenced. Let's be honest. You guys have been influenced by James White's response to John 17, 3. Which means you've been listening to more of James White and how to respond to John 17, 3 and not heard other presentations on how to deal with John 17, verse 3. May God crucify our flesh, especially my flesh, destroy my flesh, destroy our par pride, our arrogance, our unrighteous anger, fill us with fruit from the Spirit, life from the Spirit, power from the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, to be washed in the blood of Jesus, to become more like Jesus, and save us from false humility and false sense of humbleness. In Jesus' name, we love you, Father, Son, and Spirit. We love you, Father, Son, and Spirit. Lord Jesus, have mercy on us, and please forgive us and be patient with us, and help us to be patient with one another. And give us the power to know your word and live out your word and love your word and defend your word and die for your word. For your word is truth and the Bible is your word, Lord Jesus. And Lord, please bless us this week. Please love my daughters and bless my daughters and preserve my daughters and cover them by your blood and fill the spirit. Bring them to me, Lord, and keep me here and save me from the snares of Chicago. Please, Lord Jesus, we need you. In Jesus' name, we love you, Son of God. We love you, Son of God. We love you, Lord Jesus. The Father's heart, his beloved. In Jesus' name, Yahovah, Father, and Spirit. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Guys, pray for me. Cloud, you're asking how it can help me. For now, I need miraculous intervention. Uh, I'm going to share it again. And I know if the wrong people listen to this, they'll try to use this against me. But we have a corrupt, wicked, evil judge in Chicago that's known to destroy men that ordered me to pay my ex-wife's legal fees, which I can't pay and I won't pay by the grace of Jesus. Because she's wicked and corrupt, right? She thinks I have a money tree. Pray God will give me favor with the appellate court. Save me from that debt. Keep me here because I can't go back to Chicago for court. I'm here. And pray he gives me favor here. So far, he's been giving me favor. So second week of December, this judge can ruin my life. Pray against it in Jesus' name because I'm tired. Tired of having to deal with this wicked, evil judge. Her name is Judge Jean Marie Reynolds. She's evil. And I know people can use this and bring it to her. I don't care. She is evil. May the Lord deal with her and teach her the fear of Jesus. I'm tired. And pray for me because though it's going to be a joyous celebration for many of you, Thanksgiving and Christmas is going to be hard for me because I'll be celebrating without my angels. I love and I ache for them. And I pray I'll be in their life sooner than later so they won't be affected and damaged by Satan because they need their earthly Baba to be there for them. So pray for me. Lord willing, tomorrow's Thanksgiving, so I won't be doing a show, but maybe Friday. Let's see. But pray because, folks, it's hard. Coming back from San Diego, I was kind of down and depressed. And now, because of Thanksgiving, I'm a little down again. But God is good. God is good all the time. And our ultimate rest, our ultimate peace, our ultimate satisfaction comes in the presence of Jesus, either by him calling us home or him coming down. I pray that either one of those things happen sooner than later. I'm despising this world more and more. And let, let me leave you with this passage. I love this passage. Hebrews 11, 38. Let me leave you with this passage. I love this passage. It's talking about the saints of God, the great men and women of faith who are now in Jesus' presence glorified. But notice what Hebrews eleven thirty eight says. No, Thomas, it's too late. It's in the appellate court, but this wicked, filthy judge won't wait for the appellate court's decision. She's still coming after me. Even though no, she knows we're waiting for the appellate court, a higher court, to decide whether she's corrupt or she decide, she judged fairly. But she doesn't want to wait. But Hebrews 11.38, let's look at this. Let's look at this. 
Yeah, but this is the passage I love. Watch here. Of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Do you know why Hebrews 11.38 blesses me? Bill Thompson was looking for you because he had a question yesterday I want to answer today. But I hope you go back and watch the sessions and don't mind me being harsh with some nuisances and distractions. And you'll be blessed still because you're one of the brothers that bless my heart when you show up. Hebrews 11.38, one more time. Exactly, Andrew Martin. See, Andrew, you're a man after my heart, and you love Jesus, and we're going to be together in heaven with Jesus. Watch here, guys. Pay attention. The Holy Spirit cannot be scared away. He's God Almighty. He's fearless. Don't ever say that and insult the Spirit again, or I'll block you. You can't scare the Holy Spirit away. That's blasphemy. Hebrews 11.38. Guys, read this. Why I love this passage. Of whom the world was not worthy. <clears throat> when I read that a while back, I actually started crying because you know why it's talking about great men and women of faith who were tortured, martyred, beaten and suffered in this world. And you know what the inspired author says? The world was not worthy of such people. They were too good for this world. Man, that moves me in my heart. You understand what it says? This wicked, evil, fallen world does not deserve the holy saints, the holy men and women of God, the children that Jesus has purchased. We're too good for this world. The world doesn't deserve us. Yep, like Keith Green, a great man of God. That's what Hebrews 11.38 says. Read the entire chapter. One more time, Pedro, so you can see. Jesus says, you are too good for this world, Pedro. This world doesn't deserve you. One more time. Hebrews 11.38, of whom the world was not worthy. Wow. May the Lord Jesus count us worthy to be part of that company of these men and women whom the Holy Spirit testifies were too good for this world. The world was not good enough for them. Guys, remember your value in Jesus. Remember your value in Jesus. Because you are one with Christ in the Spirit, you're covered by the blood of Jesus. You're sealed by a Spirit. You are too good for this world. This world doesn't deserve you like it didn't deserve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Beautiful, right? So again, don't, don't misunderstand me. If the Lord is pleased to take me home, I say, Lord, as long as I'm covered by your blood and you fill me with spirit and give me the grace to face death and laugh at it, I'm ready to go because you don't need me. Right? You don't need me. But if you want me to stick around to be used for your glory, then you're worthy. Just comfort me, Lord Jesus, and save me from a legal system that will destroy me if you don't intervene because I can't beat the legal system. I'll lose. Cindy, member, Cindy, because you wanted to hear it, let me remind you again. Because you are purchased by the blood of Jesus, the Father's heart. Because, Cindy, you are born of the Spirit. And this is for every one of you, born of the Spirit. Because you are united to Christ and you are the daughter of God the Father, the world does not deserve you. You're too good for this world. You belong to Jesus. You belong in heaven. And then Jesus is going to bring heaven down on earth, and he's going to make earth heaven for us, and no more wicked will dwell on it. Thank you, Father, Holy Spirit. We love you. Happy Thanksgiving. I love you guys. See you, Lord willing, soon. Christ is risen, risen indeed.